Well, good morning, everybody, and thank you for turning up because we know this is going to be a very interesting couple of hours that we're going to be spending here. Just before we start, I hope you've all got the latest, your latest copy of Aero Modeler magazine. The remarkable thing about it on this occasion is that 13 pages of the magazine have been contributed by members of Peterborough. Um, if you haven't got yours yet and you'd like to see them, there are three copies on the table over there revealing the three articles that have been contributed by us. Right, moving on from that, um, what is going to happen this morning is that I'm going to hand over to John in a moment, who is going to entertain us on free flight stability, something that we like to think we know a lot about, but we will probably realize shortly that we don't. There will be a tea break halfway through, and then in the second half, we are going to talk about and make some decisions about the possibility of um, extending our radio flying down at ferry. So, we must waste no more time, and I'm very pleased to hand over to John. Okay, thank you, John. So, free flight stability is probably the most important thing we have to think about as free flighters, isn't it? Because once we let go of the model, it's, it's on its own. Whatever we've done is then set in stone. <laughs> so what, this is going to be, um, we're going to try and uh, cover a lot of ground, but the, the purpose is the conceptual approach. So trying to understand what is happening. Um, we have got a slideshow which hopefully works. And also we'll have some questions as well. So let's start with the next slide. Okay, so I don't know if you can read that. Any Molesworth fans? I want you to regard this as a challenge, Molesworth. <laughs> Algebra. No, well, it's Molesworth, yeah. <laughs> okay, so <clears throat> the point being that you can get really into this. You can, it can be very dense. Um, and we won't go too much into the mathematics behind it, but the maths really is just a tool, like you've got tools on your bench. You've got, you know, maybe a micrometer, maybe you've got um, a ruler, maybe you've got a tachometer on your bench. But the maths is just a tool to measure something and to understand it. So we put that together with the concepts and it can help us to understand what's going on. But the problem is, there are so many things going on, there are so many complex reactions and interactions with stability in flight dynamics that we can get a bit of a muddle and get into the details and not always understand the significance of each effect. Many of the little things that when you change something, something else happens, they are called derivatives. So if you change, you know, a gust comes along and the angle of attack changes, everything else on the model will change and those are called derivatives. The complex thing is knowing which ones are negligible and present but don't matter, and which ones actually are gonna crash your model. So we're looking for that simple conceptual approach to what is actually happening, and then we wanna think about the practical, what can we actually do about it? What can we change to make our model stable? Now, the difficulty with free flight is that there are so many different disciplines and every discipline has a slightly different challenge aerodynamically and we come up with kind of uh, maxims about these ideas that work in one situation but then we try and apply it to a different type of model and it's something else. So we all get a bit in our bubbles with perhaps control line, perhaps with duration, perhaps with scale. We all have tactics, we are, you know, it becomes kind of folklore, doesn't it? The wisdom of trimming. But you take these concepts from one discipline into another and it doesn't work. But it's still flying, it's still physics, there's still rules, there's still forces and moments and you can change things. But you've subtly changed all of these interactions, these derivatives. So we're gonna try and keep it really, really simple and we're gonna try and look at some of the very, um, the, the, the important concepts, okay? so. The model has three dimensions of, of flight. Can you? 
Oh, sorry, it's because of the camera as well. <laughs> okay, so three axes. You're familiar with pitch. Let's do it with a model. Pitch, obviously, roll, ailerons, dihedral, and then yaw, the rudder. Those are the three axes. And one of the light bulb moments, light bulb moments for me was realising that all of those things, they rotate the model or all of those forces act on the center of gravity while the model is flying. That's the pivot for everything. So if you change something in, in, in the tail, it will pivot at the center of gravity. If you change the dihedral angles or the yaw angles, it will pivot at the center of gravity. So that is our most important point. So first of all, let's get, let's get interactive. So what is instability? Can you give me some ideas or you know, what problems make a model unstable in different disciplines. Any ideas? Yeah, centre of gravity. Big big thing we can do something about, isn't it? Any others? Dihedral, so spiral mode. It's called the spiral mode where a model will tip over onto one wing and then start to dive into a spiral dive. So the converse of that is Dutch roll. We've seen that one where the model is wallowing. It's too much dihedral sometimes. Um, one you might not think of is weak stability in yaw if the fin is too small. You sometimes see this on model jets, catapult jets particularly, where they get too far out of yaw and they'll snap and snap and spin basically. So that's another one. And then one that's a bit of a complex, it's a bit of a middle ground one, is the wing drop in a stall. So if, it, if you get into a stall, if you've flown a Spitfire, you know what you're talking about. It will drop a wing and then dive away. So those are sort of the five main problems of stability, of instability, rather. So what we need to do then is define, so that we can target it, we need to define stability. So what is stability? How would you define it? Yes, exactly. So it's a corrective response to an upset. If the model is upset by a gust or a poor launch or you know some some event and it ends up in a attitude we don't want, we want a response that corrects it. That is basically what stability is. Okay. So notes. Good. Covered all of this. Sorry. Um, yeah. So. We've got two, two different things we could, where we can change things. We've got, at the design stage, we can make choices that will give us stability. So that might be things like how much dihedral do we give the model? It could be how big do we make the fin? Do we need to enlarge the tail plane? Things like that. Where do we put the CG in theory? Because we need to put components in the model to make the CG at least reasonably accurate. And then, of course, we have trimming choices. So once we've built the model, we've finished it, we've designed it, we then have a few things that we can change. And that basically is flying surfaces, changing decollage, or um, what's known as the longitudinal dihedral. That's decollage is the proper word for it. And then the, the position of the center of gravity, so nose weight and that kind of thing. We can't really change dihedral once we've built the wing, can we? Not, not in most models. Okay, so what we need to do is break down stability into its three phases. And this was a light bulb moment for me. So there are three different aspects to stability. Let's go next slide. So number one is to get the model trimmed in the first place. It has to be able to balance in trim and fly straight and level with no upset to start with. What we can do is we can illustrate that by balance, this is just a little piece of bolster dowel, that is balanced. It's in trim, the, the forces are all there acting on it, gravity and various things, I don't know if you can see it very well. But it's, it's balanced, but it's not stable. Because there's no corrective force to return it to balance. So we need more than just balance, we need more than just a model that can be trimmed. We need, number two, static stability. We need that initial pushback, that response to an upset. And we can illustrate that with 
a piece of dowel on a spring. Now, you know, it's in the same position as this one, but when you push it off balance, it's pushing back. And that is the static stability, the initial response. It is pushing back and becomes back to its original position. Now, that's good, but we need also the third point, dynamic stability. When it pushes back, it overshoots our balance point and it has to get back again. And that's dynamic stability, which is the response over time. Now that gets a bit more complicated. So let's illustrate it with a model. We trim it to fly in balance. No rotational forces or all the rotational forces must be balanced, basically. It catches a gust and this flying surface is then pushed back to give us back towards the balance point. But they don't get us to the balance point, it overshoots and then damping is what gets us dynamic stability and back to the point we want to get to. Okay, so that damping is really important. If, if you, most of you have got some knowledge or are engineers, in your car you have a similar system. This is a really good analogy for stability. You have a spring, but if you didn't have dampers, it would be an awful ride, wouldn't it? <laughs> it would just be like that. So if you see the, if you see the, the wibble wobble here, look, if I give it a real ping, the damping on this is not great. So it will do that forever. Not ever, but quite a long time. So it's stable, but it's not dynamically very stable. It's statically stable, it's not dynamically stable. So we'll look into some of the factors um, in two different areas where these three different aspects of stability are important. The first one we said was in pitch. So pitch stability, can you think as well about um, thinking about instability? Have you seen fugoids? Do you know what fugoids are? How would you describe that? Yeah, so actually the model is not stalling. It looks like a stall. It has that same pattern, but the model isn't stalling. It's accelerating and then falling over the top. Sorry, it's accelerating down, and then it's, it's flying this pattern in a lovely, wavy <laughs> kind of thing. It's not a stall at all. It's just riding its little way through the sky. Um, and the reason for that is because it's not damped. It's not damped enough. We'll come into that. And it, so that's pitch stability. We'll look at pitch, and then we'll look at lateral stability, which combines, it couples yaw and roll together. And that's the one where we can have Dutch roll or we can have spiral dive. So let's look at, first of all, the forces involved in pitch. Familiar with that one, that diagram of a model in flight? And the equilibrium means that all of those forces are balanced and it's not accelerating or decelerating, it's just in steady level flight. Now, that's pretty familiar. The, di the difficulty with that is that it assumes that the weight acts through the centre of gravity, correct, and that the lift acts through the centre of gravity, incorrect. And of course, thrust and drag, they don't act through the centre of gravity if we have down thrust. So let's look at the next one. This is more accurate. The wing itself has, when it flies, a wing with camber has an inherent pitching moment. So how would you describe a moment? Again, most of you are engineers. It's a force, but it's not acting at the center. It's acting at some distance away from a center, and it causes a rotation. So it's a lever, essentially. We said, didn't we, that the center of gravity is a pivot, and the wing, the lift could be ahead or behind that center of gravity, causing a nose up or a nose down pitch. In this case, um, we have a small tail, and to make it all balanced, the tail is actually working against gravity. It's actually downloaded with a small tail. Now, the wing pitching moment is interesting. There's actually, um, I don't think I brought the right wing with me, but I'll do it with this one. Like we said, everything has to, Like we said, everything has to balance, but the rotational forces also have to balance to, for us to be in trim. So when you see 
a, a wing without those things in balance, this is what happens. Can you see? Rotational forces. Now, to balance that wing pitching moment, we need to put another force in, and that is what the tail is providing. It's a bit like with a helicopter. It has the cyc cyclical and uh, rotor, doesn't it? The rotor at the back to provide the right balancing force. The tail's doing the same thing. So that's a little bit more accurate. What if our tail is really big? We move the centre of gravity back far enough, we get more lift, well not more lift, but it's a bigger lever further forward, and eventually the tail needs to give us lift. And we can see that on a duration model, where the tail is really, really big, and then that is giving us lift. And then that gives us the ability to trim with stabiliser tilt, tail tilt, because it gives us another thing to play with. So a bit more complicated, but big tails lift, small tails push down. Okay, so we're getting somewhere. Um, next slide. Last thing to think about is thrust line effects. So drag and thrust don't act through the centre of gravity either and they will give us a moment. Now, to get all these to balance, that's the actual diagram. <laughs> that's what you see in the aerodynamics textbooks and it covers all of the points that we've, we've mentioned basically can break it down into the maths, it gives us the pitching moments, the tail contribution, the drag contribution, all of these different things, and it will literally give you the number, and if that is zero, we're in equilibrium, we're trimmed, we're balanced. Okay, so that is how pitch stability works. Now, what is the response then to an upset in this force diagram? Go back to that one. Well, you change the angle of attack on the wing with a gust, the tail lift has to change. If the tail lift changes to give us a corrective force, it may reduce or increase to, to straighten us up, then the model is positively statically stable. Now we know that if we move the centre of gravity, it, that force, that response changes. If we move the centre of gravity forwards, we get a stronger response, positive response. If we move the centre of gravity back, eventually we get to the point which is called the neutral point, where it doesn't change, nothing changes, you don't get a response. And in that situation, when the model goes out of whack in pitch, it will just hold that attitude. Take it further back and you get an unhelpful response, and then the model is divergent in pitch. If you get off trim, it's going. And of course, in full-size aviation, they use that in fighter jets with computers to control, to do all of this for us, and that instability makes them very manoeuvrable, doesn't it? But for free flight, we need the centre of gravity in a position which will give us the appropriate response. Okay, so we come to then what size the tail is and how that makes a difference. If we look at this equation, this is called the... It's not doing it. <laughs> there we are. Tail volume. Have you heard of the concept of tail volume? So basically it's a measure. It's another metric. It's just like wing loading or aspect ratio. It's just another design metric. It's not inherently of itself anything useful, but it tells us something about the tail. This we break down. This is one of the reasons that math is tricky, by the way, is because of abbreviations. If you don't know it, you're stuffed, aren't you? Um, the nomenclature can get very dense, but it's a, it's a way of making things very um, compact, basically. So we can break this down and split it up into these different factors. I don't know if you can see this, but this is the equation written out it gives us the, the things that make the tail more effective, basically. The bigger it is, and the further back from the centre of gravity. The longer the lever, the bigger the force. And those things combine to give us a number called tail volume. And we can calculate this very easily because people have come up with ways of doing it, files. This one is from John Barker. You might remember Hepcats and Lulus. This is John Barker's file who he never actually published this. He sent this to me personally. Um, we used to correspond. 
But you put in your dimensions of your model, your wing, your tail, the moment arms, various things, the centre of gravity, and then it spits out where the neutral point is. And that's perfect because the static margin is what we are trying to find, which is the centre of gravity position that gives us that appropriate response. So with a calculator, we find the neutral point, the point with no response, and then we move the CG forward by something like 10% of the wing cord, and then that gives us a nice response. So this brings us to the question that John mentioned. Um, I asked for kind of questions if, if anyone had sort of things they wanted to talk about. And it, it's a method of trimming in free, in free flight indoor scale, which basically means shove the center of gravity as far forward as you can, get plenty of decollage, plenty of tail incidents, and really maximize that initial static response. So that works indoors <laughs> where there are minimal upsets and pretty much the, the, the responses in, in, indoors are going to be because the model is just slightly off trim, just slightly. So that initial response is, is strong. It holds it right to that trimmed point. Take that outdoors and then you have a problem because this is static margin, by the way. Sorry, I'm a bit behind on the slide. So you have the neutral point in the middle and then you move the center of gravity forward by that percentage. 5% to 15% will give you a sensible amount of stability in pitch. Um, indoor trimming, we end up with pitch stiffness. That means that if you have the CG, you've probably found this with your own flying, if the CG is too far forward, it's very sp speed specific. If you increase power, it will zoom. It will put the nose up. So too much stability is a problem for lots of different reasons. It could mean that you can't maneuver to get away from the Red Baron. <laughs> it could mean that you've got a one speed model. And in free flight duration, we have a lot of power and we want to also fly slow. So we want to do two different things. We want to climb fast but then glide slow. So we need um, that range, that speed range. And that comes from having a large tail and a rearward CG. That's one of the reasons why we have big tail volumes on duration models. Okie dokie. Right, so numbers, putting numbers to um, that tail volume, basically it gives you a dimensionless number. So something between 0.5 and 1. Um, the duration models would be up at one with big tails, maybe a quarter of the wing area in the tail. But of course, when you get down to radio models, you haven't got quite the same issues. That's 0.4 because I'm trying to get rid of drag. We don't want a big tail on a duration on a radio model. So there's a big variety, but looking at that number tells you a lot about how sensitive it will be. Because as you make the tail smaller, we had this, this pitch stiffness, this speed problem that we talked about, but also it becomes very sensitive to the position of the center of gravity. You probably find that if you make the tail too small on a model, just the movement of the rubber as it unwinds will change the center of gravity and that makes, makes it sensitive. So bigger tails cope better with small shifts of center of gravity. It makes them more tolerant, basically. Okay, so any questions? What about the, I'm thinking of indoor model. Yes. Where, you, uh, where I found uh, the overall weight of the model is difficult. Yep. Because you're being judged on scale speed, apart from the fact that it's got to fly well. So you've got the difficulty of um, getting it to take off, and then, which requires some speed, but then settles down to what you call scale speed. Yes, yeah, so you would indoor model is trimmed for it's basically is a one speed model so although that is the perception of it you're not increasing speed to take off you're increasing thrust yeah. so if you imagine with a, a zombie profiler you know if you're going to fly electric indoor scale you have a profiler which gives you power to climb and then it slackens off but they are set up with a very forward center of gravity and that makes them one speed so you take that power away and it will not slow down, it will just climb or, 
or descend on that, but it will always be roughly at that speed. Um, you'll see them when they cut the power, um, they don't sort of zoom or, or continue, they just follow that, yeah. follow that speed, yeah. So the, it's, I don't know if you've done any actual flying, but you don't climb with speed, you climb with power. Your engines, you set the speed with the elevator and then you set the rate of climb with throttle, basically. And it's, it's similar. All right, good. So any, anyone else? Mick. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Good. It was. It was. It was way back. Yeah. So you remember we spoke about tail volumes. The Dixielander has a massive, massive tail. It's one point two. I only know this because um, the, there's um, a chap who built an E20 as a Dixielander, basically. Oh, yeah. Really cute little thing. So it has a few different things. Do you remember um, the risk of losing my place here? Um, this wing pitching moment, this rotation, that is not, that's just inherent to a wing with camber. It's not actually, it's what you call a pure moment. It doesn't actually have a lever and a force. It's just that any wing with camber is gonna pitch over. The Dixie Lander has a 6% 6 camber on it. It has a lot of camber. It has quite a high aspect wing, quite a high aspect tail. Um, the thrust settings, all of it works to, to, to the point where the center of the, the static margin, do you remember we said about the, the, new, the neutral point is, is way, way back. Uh, but the static margin on a Dixie Lander is also way, way small. So it's a combination of all of those factors. If you think about it in a different way, uh, we are flying conventional aircraft with a tail, but a canard has got to do it the other way around. So the center of gravity is in space <laughs> from a wing point of view, but the same balance has to be achieved, the same rotational balance. Um, a canard is, there is no difference really between um, a conventional aircraft like that and a canard or a tandem wing. You just make the tail, a, a canard basically it's just a very tiny wing with a very big tail volume. <laughs> Does that make sense? So it's, like we said, the larger it is, the more lift it provides. Well, if you make it, take it to extreme, you get a canard, then all of the lift is coming from, nearly all the lift is coming from the rearward surface. Okay, but. Yes, yeah, so volume, it's just, a, it's just a, a different thing. So when you look at the numbers, that's the formula, and it's because it's multiplied. So it's it's not a, a linear measure; it's a volume measure. Does that make sense? No, no, it's not. It is just it's like a it's just a mathematical term, really. It just it just it's a measure of effectiveness, basically. Um, John. Yeah, yeah. If you've got a smaller tailplane further back, yep. then you get, you get a bigger volume. No, the, the, two, the two multiply. So at the bottom there, at the top there, these factors, SH is the square of the horizontal. So it's the horizontal tail area at the top. And the LH is the length of the horizontal. So it's the moment and the area. Yeah. You can have the same tail volume with a short yeah. moment arm and a big tail mm. as a long tail and a small. You the tail volume is, it times the, times is the two things together to give you a volume, basically. That's, that's why it's called a volume. What's so, uh, That's S times C, so it's area, wing area times cord. So basically, when you, when you break this down, you've got on the bottom of that equation are the things that destabilize, bigger wing, bigger cord, and on the top of the equation, you've got the things that stabilize. Bigger tail area, longer tail moment. Can you just the absolute word for the, for, for the letters then? So V yeah. volume. There you go. I don't know if you can see that, Stuart, but yeah. it's... Uh, so what is, what is H? What V stands for volume, doesn't it? Yeah, vo volume of the horizontal tail. Of the horizontal tail. Yeah. yeah. So VV, they do the same for the fin. V for the VV is volume of the vertical tail. Right. 
Okay, and that's a different equation, but it's the same idea. Yeah. Okay, so, good. Go, go, go see. Go see. With the wind, there's a centre of pressure, isn't there? That's how I move. Good question. Great question. Yeah, and that moves about, doesn't it? Yeah. Along its cord and also its length as well. Yeah, so, so this is a, good, a really good question and a detailed one as well, Steve. But yeah. um, centre of pressure was a, 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 a mathematical method that was established initially. And then what, what that really does is describes the pitching moment in a different way. They realise that the lift of a wing actually acts at... Go back to this. We're getting into detail here, so f forgive me. But the wing lift actually at acts at the quarter chord, 25% of the chord. And that center of pressure was just, um, they, they, they were measuring the pitching moment in a different way. So it's like that pressure moved to a different place and caused a, but mathematically you can split it up into the pitching moment and then you put all the lift at the quarter chord and that it simplifies everything basically. So. Yeah, so that's... Beyond the CG, then that pushes the nose Yeah, it is, it is exactly the... Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. That is the same concept, but it's a different way of explaining it. So the, the, what we do is that centre of pressure, we split that down into the lift acting at the quarter chord and then an extra moment on top. So that lift always stays the same in that position, but the faster you fly, the more pitch you, pitching moment you get. And that is the same as moving back that centre of pressure. It's a bit complex. I should have um, should have thought about that and how to explain it better. Bit spicy. Yeah. You've got to get involved, yeah, yeah. Fugoid, yeah, yeah. So that actually brings us very nicely to the next step. So we've talked about so far just that initial... No, 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 that's good. The danger of these things is that there are so many rabbit holes. <laughs> so we have to keep it simple, but, but we, I can talk about that another time. It, centre of pressure is basically the old way of looking at it. The newer way since the 50s, 40s, 50s is lift in one place and then this moment... Um, can we come back to that one because the next stage the next part will answer that one to some degree so let's move on to dynamic pitch stability so we started to talk already about that damping in pitch now let me show you a video this is the, the model that I showed you before sorry the BD5 which was a Bostonian it's not scale but it's based on the BD5 the little um, James Bond thing Do you, you know that little jet and it has a particularly short tail moment and it also has a, other things going wrong with it. But let's have a look at it fly first. Okay. <laughs> There you go. That's a few guys. <laughs> yeah. So basically, it has really strong static stability. Although it has a short tail, it has a, a large tail volume, big area. But it doesn't have the damping, basically. And that's kind of what you were talking about, Brian. It would be trimmed to a point where it was stable, but if you take it too far, you're not going to get a stable that response. So it's going up and down. And interestingly, drag is involved in damping. So if you take a, a model and you make it more efficient, I actually had a Bostonian where 
I put a better wing section on it. It was my own design. I put a more efficient, more lower drag wing on it, and it became unstable because drag actually is one of the things. If you can imagine with this wibble wobble, if there was, if this was in treacle, the drag would slow it quicker, basically. Now the the BD5 also has a problem, which is it's this is a real big one for stability, which we don't pay enough attention to, is inertia. So rubber power model P20, we just think, oh, we'll just extend the nose as long as we can to get as much rubber in as we can, but then we get inertia problems, and that's what you can see with the BD5, with this really long nose. When it overshoots, the nose wants to keep going <laughs> because of the weight in, in the nose, and the same is true in, in your as well. If you look at this frequency of the wibble wobble, can you see that? Put some inertia, a bit of blue tack on the top, and see what see what happens. Inertia makes quite a big difference. It will go for longer, and it changes the period of the oscillation. Don't know if you see that over there, but you get the idea. So inertia is really important. Make your wing tips light. Make your tail light. Don't extend the nose too much. Um, it, it helps with that dynamic damping. Okay, we need to move on, I'm afraid. <laughs> Only halfway through. No, it was a dog. <laughs> right, little dark kitten. This one takes us to a different problem altogether, so we're going to move on to wing drop in the stall. Now, can you see what's wrong with that? It's got very tapered wings. That's the problem. You're probably familiar with this idea. Um, you can see it fly. It flies really nice and stable, actually. But then as it slows down towards the end, it's quite a long video, I'm afraid. It flies okay, it's going well, and then gradually as it slows down towards the end of the flight, you'll see what happens. Any moment, next turn, maybe not this one. <laughs> there, look. Whoop. And that is basically asymmetric stall, because lift is distributed across the wing in an ellipse, elliptical wing. There's less wi lift at the top, at the edge of the wing where it's bleeding pressure away and more in the middle. And if we take the plan form look with no taper at the top, that ellipse loads the midsection of the wing and lets the tips keep flying in a stall. The tips keep flying and the nose drops and that's a stable stall. Um, the middle one there it gets rid of any unused wing and it's the most aerodynamically efficient but the bottom one with a lot of taper it overloads the tips of the wing and when it stalls it's almost always got some kind of yaw on it and one goes first that's what tip stall is okay so we won't go into that too much okay so that kind of completes pitch pitch stability summary we want a positive response from the tail to any upset. We change that response by moving the CG. If we move it far enough back, we get to a point with no response. That's the neutral point. Okay? And then dynamic stab um, stability is that over time. Right. Is everyone, is anyone actually asleep yet? <laughs> <laughs> Let's move on to lateral problems. This is actually really where I don't think I don't think lateral stability is understood very well. How dihedral and yaw react and interact together. So Dutch roll is one problem. It's one of my P20s. All I can say is that if you were on board that, you would have been sick. You can see it really rolling around, rocking and rolling. And of course the converse of that is the spiral dive, which it's pretty common to free flighters. Um, one of the problems with scale modelling particularly is that very few real models, real aircraft, are stable in that sense, spirally. Because Dutch roll does not make for a happy passenger, but the spiral dive problem is a very slow, s slow process. It takes 10, 20, 30 seconds to get to anything like noticeable. And you've got a pilot. So why would you make it stable so the pilot can have a snooze when he's doing his job and all he's got to do is just pay attention. So 
that pitching o over and, and diving is very much a common problem in scale modeling. So we tend to increase the dihedral a little, but how much is the question? Here we have, again, the derivatives, the mass behind it, but we will talk about the four different effects. When a model, when a model gets upset to the side, it will side slip, and that will change the angle of attack on the wings. Um, at the same time, so at the same time, it's basically the, the upset that we're talking about is that side slip. What happens when you side slip? Basically, that's how the spiral mode works. The factors on the left, dihedral effect and the damping in your, help. The factors on the right, the roll rate due to your rate and your stability are harmful. So. We'll explain that. This gets quite tricky and quite complex. If you don't get it, don't worry about it. We'll brush over most of it, but you will understand the effects and the concepts behind it. You're probably familiar that when you yaw, um, you'll get a dihedral effect from, from yaw. That's what a dihedral does. It rolls you back. Angles, yeah. So how does that actually work geometrically? Well, if you fold a piece of paper and you your it, you can see more of the one side than the other. In other words, you're changing the angle of attack on the wing, make more lift on the downside, and it rolls it up. So that's how geometric dihedral works. You've also got the fin acting. If the fin is very, very stable, remember we said that initial response really doesn't want to come off that your trim, it will push the nose towards the dive. Do you see how that works? So you've gone into a side slip and you're side slipping. The tail, strong static initial response, it will push the nose further into the dive. And that then increases the side slip and, the, and it, it, that's where you get your spiral dive. So you actually don't want too much static fin stability to get good spiral stability. If you do have a, a big powerful fin and it gets into a side slip and not much dihedral, that's where you get your spiral from. In, in my early start on spiral stability, I was flat on it, and, and he uses variable washout. Washout. Yes. What about the effect of a washout tip on stability? That is a very good question, Brian, and it <laughs> depends. <laughs> Washout is very useful, it, but basically, remember, do you remember that picture with the condensation over the wing? What washout does is it just tweaks the um, distribution of that lift. It doesn't really do anything for spiral stability. I'd have to read that to, to, to come back to you, really, on L style. Washout can help in some ways, but it is not the driver. It's not the one you want to worry about, really, when it comes to spiral stability. So with the cure for so the, the size of the tail is really important because it has to avoid the snap, but it wants to also avoid that weathercock into the dive. So basically, you can go too big or you can go too small. But what helps more than anything is the long tail moment because the, the actual thing that we want to impre improve is the ratio between the initial damping, that weathercock into the dive, and its ability to sorry, not initial damping, the damping is important. So when you put things on the front of the plane, it reduces the yaw stability, the weathercock. You put the, the prop on the front, it reduces that power, doesn't it? Because it's ahead of the center of gravity. But you still have the damping that you need. It actually increases the damping. So spiral stability, as I say, it's really, really complicated. It's all about that ratio between the power of the fin and the damping of the fin. And the best way you can do, um, the best thing you can do is to lengthen the tail because we talked about the effectiveness of the longer tail, but damping improves by the square of that length. On a scale model, you can't do it. Yeah, exactly. But you can choose which ones to do. That's a good so let's, let's move on, let's move on. But you get the idea that there's two things going on. There's the dihedral effect, and then there's the fin effect. And it, it can be soft and allow the dihedral to work, 
or it can be uptight and push it into the dive. And that's the balance that we have to get. Now you might have heard of this one, just make the dihedral, just put the wingtips at the same height as the canopy. What does that tell you? Have you heard, have you heard that one? It's a scale models, models thing. Just, just increase the, wing, the dihedral until the tips are level with the canopy. Well, it basically just means put a hell of a load of dihedral in. <laughs> because I have a challenge for those people. <laughs> what are you going to do there? <laughs> it, it, the, the, the canopy, totally irrelevant. It is totally irrelevant. It's just a way of saying you need a bit more dihedral. So we can increase dihedral, but we don't want to do that too much if we're doing a scale model. We need to know how much we can get away with. The good news, or the bad news we don't really know <laughs> we do have to guess with some of this stuff and you probably know that dihedral effect is not just the geometry of the, the angle of the dihedral it's things like the position of the wing so let's look at some of the things the high wing and the low wing the airflow we said it was yawed so we're getting flow over the fuselage and a high wing position is different to a low wing position I can illustrate that with the Galaxy and the 737. High wing position, it actually makes the Galaxy, because it's such a big aircraft, C5 Galaxy, it makes it too stable. So we use anhedral to make it controllable. The low wing does need some dihedral to be stable. And that just shows how much fuselage effect plays into it. And you're probably familiar with this little beast. The Lacey, M10 Lacey. Andrew's not here, is he? <laughs> Carry on. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, so Andy, Andy's a big fan of the, uh, the Lacey M10. And it, it has no geometric dihedral, but the effect of... In, in this case here, it's side-slipping to the left. That fuselage is kind of blanking the lift on the upper wing, which me makes the the lower wing more effective and it causes roll. So it's the same idea. So going back to Brian's point, which was an excellent point, you can't change the tail length on a scale model, not a real one anyway. Um, we'll come back to the Lacey. This, this is the Jenny, Curtis Jenny. So you might think that looks really good. Most people eyeball it, don't they? And you think, mm, that looks really good. It doesn't look too bad. But actually it's got a very... Wide, um, high wingspan and a very short tail when you look at the numbers um, we go to this drawing I don't know if you can see that very well but that's the Jenny on the left and the wingspan, that circle is just the wingspan Okay, all of the tail is within that distance look at the Lacey same wingspan that tail moment is considerably bigger in relation to the wing and that's the thing that matters it's not just the length it's in relation to the wing so one of the other effects we haven't described is what was you may remember it was called your roll rate due to your rate when it's side slipping and it pulls in further this this wing tip and this wing tip are now going at different speeds yeah. and this is a negative effect because the, the wingtip we want to give more lift is the left one. But, but it's not the one that's going faster. It's going slower. So that is, a, is, is the rate of your increasing the rate of, you, of roll. Does that make sense? Now if you look at a model like this, you yaw that by a few degrees and because it's got a very short tail and a very high aspect ratio, the wingtip is moving much further than it would on the Lacey. And that's a real, a real effect in spiral stability. So when you come to picking your models for scale modelling, tail length in relation to wingspan is a really critical factor. That, for me, was a light bulb. That was one that I don't think I've heard anywhere else, really. But that relationship between the span and the length of the tail is critical. You can work it out mathematically as to why that is. And we'll go back to, this is the tail moment, by the way. Centre of gravity to the quarter chord. Everything's quarter chord when it comes to aerodynamic forces. 
Okay, and that, that is the calculation for a stable model. So this, this is where you don't have external factors like propellers, um, big fuselages. So this works for gliders like this type of glider, where it is simply the, the fin that's doing the, the stabilizing, nothing else. The, the damping as well. So everything on that is, comes from the fin. Won't go into that too much, but there is a number that you want to target to get the right amount of dihedral, the right length of the tail. And actually the fin area is not as important as that tail mo moment length, basically. So I do do that calculation for scale models, but it doesn't work precisely because you've got other factors playing a role and then you have to kind of guess and balance. But So the thing, the lesson, if we can call it that, going back to this, um, sorry, I keep looking at the wrong thing on this think that one going back to this thing is what dihedral you have is augmented or hurt by things like the fuselage and in the case of the lacy the fuselage is giving it something like three or four degrees of, of dihedral that it doesn't actually geometrically have but what what you do with that dihedral and how effectively you use that is determined by the length of the tail. So you, the lacy has not much dihedral effect, but a good long tail. The Jenny, that you might think was a good scale model, has proved to be quite spirally unstable without an increase of dihedral. So it's just funny, isn't it? You get your eye in, but you have to, have to kind of, sometimes you get caught out. T-L-A-R, isn't it? That looks about right. Most of us will guess. And I'll be quite honest, Although I enjoy the maths, I'm also making a slightly educated guess, but it's, there is no precision when it comes to spiral stability. You just look at a model, you think, hmm, that's going to be an issue, or I think I would like a bit more dihedral, or let's just try it and see. So, uh, there we are. Um, yeah, how was it? Yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you were doing that all the time. Yeah, the tig tiger moth is another one that's very, very soft in yaw, and um, you have to have active feet to fly that. Yeah, not that I do. <laughs> okay, cool. That that concludes really. So, pitch stability, one one type of stability, and then lateral stability is the combination, the coupling between yaw and roll, and uh, we obviously need those. When it comes to duration models, we don't have the constraints of trying to look like something, do we? We can make it look like whatever we like but the demands of the task transition from a weird attitude two different speeds all of those things make the challenge a little bit more tricky to get right okay any questions that's me done what about problem models john had a pushy cat was it oh yes i was hoping to build a big pushy cat now most Yes. And I would like to ask you your, your views on both of those items separately, as well as both of those items put together in the same model. Yes, exactly. And you've brought up that which I've forgotten about, which remember we said about the dihedral effect. It's not just the geometric dihedral, it's the effect overall of things like the fuselage plus the geometric dihedral. Sweep is another one. So if when you have a swept wing, if you if you're yawing, you advance one wing differently differently to the other with sweep exacerbates that and is a positive effect so sweep gives stability without the actual angle of dihedral basically so i think with the pushy cat the sweep angles are not great they're not massive um you're talking angles more like not quite csr2 but you know you're talking more like above 30 20 degrees of sweep where they start to have an effect the the sweep helpful effect of sweep on dihedral depends on the speed of the aircraft as you fly slower you get more effect from that so it helps with the glide phase um, but yeah it's a bit of a complicated one but sweep is helpful which is why you see people f flying rapier jets with anhedral because the sweep is doing all of the 
the right kind of things to help the dihedral effect, the total effect, basically. Um, pusher models. Basically, we have talked about mostly about conventional models here, but we're talking about the principles and the concepts. So we can apply all of those little different elements to, for example, a pusher prop, which is behind the centre of gravity. It's drag behind the centre of gravity, and it also has a, so a certain amount of lift effect because it, a propeller is a little bit like a little tiny wing. But because they're all behind the centre of gravity, they stabilise. If you, if you have a propeller in front of the CG, usual tractor propeller, it is destabilising. And you might find a model like this where you put a bigger prop on and all of a sudden it will snap because you've destabilised the system. Or you might find that it, a model that is spirally unstable, you put a bigger prop on it and all of a sudden the damping is better and it becomes spirally stable. So these little things do add up and do make a difference. John, with your pushy cat, that propeller is behind the centre of gravity, so it's adding to the fin power, it's adding to that fin effect. So in the balance of things, you would need a slightly smaller fin. But you're talking per percentages, and, and, and there are other things that are probably more important. But, but all of these different things about different configurations, they all fit into this pattern. Like we said, we learn a certain way of doing things, and then you transfer it to a different model, and then it doesn't work. But the principles will be the same. The, the drag moments, the pitching moments, different things. The high thrust line is a good one as well. Do you remember Bernie had um, a, Westling, a West Wings Widgeon um, parasol model with quite a high parasol on it and he, it had a negative tail incidence and he didn't believe that that was the right way to go and put a positive tail incidence on it and ended up having to put a huge wedge of down thrust in to make it fly because although it doesn't look right, that tail was opposing the drag moment pitch up. So the balance was right, and it was giving you trim, but we do things a certain way because that's what we're comfortable with. But again, understanding the concepts, the mass is there just as a tool, but if you, if you know what's going on, then you take an unusual model and you go, okay, I don't know how much, but I can expect a little bit of this, or I think I will take this scale model and I'll give it two extra degrees of dihedral to be safe, or I'll pick that model because it, don't, it doesn't need it. Just an example of that, actually, and I have nearly finished, don't worry. <laughs> that is a, a scale tail on the dark kitten. I picked it because it was sufficiently big tail volume at scale, not enlarged at all. So this is, again, this is the thing. We do because that's what we do, yeah. but there are models you don't need to. So the, the, the measure of tail volume is you can look at it and you go, ah, 0.4 tail volume, I'm, I'm okay with that. I can fly it like that. Or you might take a different model and it's 0.3 and you think, hmm, that's going to be tricky, I'll enlarge it. So whilst I get a lot of, sla of stick for, from some scale models on the internet who think that the aerodynamicists are trying to stop them from flying proper scale models. It's not. We're trying to make them as scale as we can without making them unflyable. That's the point. So we want to give it dihedral, but we don't want to just put it where the canopy is. We want to give it just enough so that it's as close to scale as we can. All right. So I think that concludes. So any further questions? Thank you for your patience. <laughs>